doubts about God, questions about the ultimate issues, skepticism, even unbelief. These things are nothing new. And today on the TNG webcast, I want to talk about reaching out to those with doubts and questions. Hi, Alex McFarland here, and I'm so grateful you're watching. Thanks for being with us today. And if you know anything about what we've been doing for the last couple of decades, it's really been doing conferences, writing books, and researching to try to reach out to people that have questions and doubts. And you know, it, it's not wrong for people to have questions about these big ultimate issues about why are we here and where did we come from and does God exist and who is God and how, how do these things relate to me? All types of people have all types of questions. And you know, that's really okay. In the Word of God in Isaiah 1.18, God says, Come, let us reason together says the Lord. Now, God invites us to come and reason and think through these issues. And I guess one of the things that we want people to know in these webcasts and in the literature that we've been able to create and the events that we've put on and our planning is that believing in God and having a relationship with the Lord is not an invitation to switch off your mind and blindly, compliantly believe something in spite of the fact that there's no legitimate reason to. Now, I honestly believe that faith in God and a relationship with the Lord, it is legitimate, it is rational. But let me explain how uh, I believe in the Western world we got to this place where unbelief and skepticism is not only pretty common and pervasive, it's actually in some quarters kind of chic and hip to call oneself an atheist. Over the last decade, there have been a number of high-profile books like Misquoting Jesus by Bart Ehrman, uh, The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, as if it's delusional to believe in God. And I've debated most of the high-profile atheists, or at least corresponded with them. In fact, I spent about two years interviewing more than two dozen professed atheists and skeptics. It was very interesting. I, I sat down and I, I would say, okay, disconvert me. Tell me why I should not believe in God or Jesus Christ or trust the Bible. And interestingly, of the atheists that I interviewed, out of 32 atheists, like 28 were ex-Christians and had at one point believed in God. Some even said that they still pray. Now they write books and many of them make their living in this cottage industry of atheism and unbelief and hyper-skepticism. And yet, many in a private moment confess that they hope there's a heaven, they want to see their loved ones again. When life is tough, they pray. And in fact, I've even had a couple of atheists, atheists, mind you, ask me to pray for them. So what about unbelief? I, I came away from all of my interviews. I ended up writing two books. I was going to write one book, 10 Answers for atheists, then I read one called Ten Answers for Skeptics, and I believe there are uh, several kinds of doubt. There, there is the inquisitive doubter who wants an answer to a question, and, and almost their position is, you know, help me, I'm, I'm open, I'm searching, I just need an answer to a question. You know, did Moses really part the Red Sea? How could that have happened? How could Elisha make an axe head float? How did Jesus feed the 5,000? And there are good, logical, empirical answers to those types of questions. There, there is what we might call a wounded skeptic. And I think that's where the majority of people that once believed in God, but now they push God away, I really believe it's emotional pain that causes this. I've met many people that are what I would call aggressive skeptics. It's not, I'm hungry for truth, I'm searching for an answer. But it's almost like, and I say this with empathy as, as, a, as an individual, but even as a pastor, been in the people business for almost three decades, the aggressive skeptic, generally the more abrasive and antithetical a person is to God, the more, the more pain they've endured. And while I, I speak out against atheism and I, I write and respond and communicate really against the hyper uh, secular mindset that's, that's so common now, th part of my heart is that we have to show empathy because the more vitriolic, the more antithetical a, a person is to God, 
the more a person you know denies God and yet wants to put God in checkmate the more my heart goes out to them because it's really like a an atheist is someone who's been through emotional pain. Now, I'm not saying they don't have legitimate questions and we need to be able to pony up the evidence, which we can do, but understand that from being inquisitive to being a passive, you know, whatever, you know, maybe there's a God, I don't care. In fact, that's probably the hardest type of person to reach out to is the person who's just apathetic about life's big primary questions. But the more aggressive the skeptic, probably the more toxic faith situation they endured and the more pain they're carrying inside. For that reason, we have to show empathy and genuine care. A teen said to me in a conference, we were talking in the lobby of an auditorium, and the, this particular teen who had read you know, blog sites aimed at young people, uh, atheist web rings, things like that, this teen said, well, if the God of the Bible exists, I have never seen him. Well, I think a lot of people are in that place. And for that reason, we need to be able to prayerfully, consistently, lovingly, patiently show them that God is real because he's real in our lives. Now, hey, let me talk a little bit about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, as many people know, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He was a great scholar at Oxford and Cambridge and uh, probably one of the most compelling voices for Christianity and really just theism in general in the 20th century. C.S. Lewis was an atheist up until about age 38, and he said that he was the most reluctant convert in all of England. He came to believe in God, have a relationship with Christ, but Lewis himself said that he came, quote, kicking and screaming through the gates of belief, but the evidence was compelling. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called God in the Dock, now, in a courtroom, the witness stand is the docket. And Lewis pointed out the irony, God has an answer, and we really don't. And, but yet we think God doesn't have an excuse, and we do. And so in the book, God in the Dock, C.S. Lewis writes a series of brilliant essays defending theism, belief that there is a God, and responding to objections, but basically saying, look, it's like the Bible is guilty until proven innocent, when in reality the inverse is true, that man, a sinner, needs to humble himself before God. But hold that thought. I want to go to a few questions right now, and we'll come back in just a minute to the defense of the Christian faith by Lewis and others. But uh, let, let's respond to a few questions. And I want to say, by the way, we love the interaction. Hey, next week, we're going to start a contest. And so, be engaged with the TNG webcast. Please share, please pass these links along, and uh, like us on social media because we're going to give you some opportunity for further interaction, plus even winning some really cool prizes, some TNG books and more. But let's go to a few bits of correspondence right now. Okay, Katie from Dallas. By the way, I just got an invitation to go to Dallas to be on a television show, interviewed Love, Texas. Katie, thanks for watching from Dallas. How should the evangelical church respond to legislation that has the possibility to harm the sanctity of the family, such as child separation at the border? Great, great question. And next week, we're going to be talking a little bit about, biblically, the role of government and the responsibility of individuals. And I will grant you, we're in a time in history where there are not always easy, pat answers to some of the legitimate situations that we face. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about government. The Bible has a lot to say about politics. So for just a minute, let me, let me pull away from the responsibilities of good civil government, just government, and let me talk about the responsibilities of people. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew 5-7, through 7, what is commonly called the Sermon of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, rather, Jesus talked about um, that we are to be peacemakers, we are to love, forgive, show charity, all of those things that we know people are supposed to do. Uh, the Greeks called it the law of general beneficence. We have this obligation to do right, to love our neighbor. Those are the responsibilities on people and, frankly, the responsibilities on followers of God, individually and corporately, persons and churches and synagogues to show beneficence. 
The government, though, oftentimes has to do things that probably look harsh or maybe even inappropriate if done by a person. Now, in Romans chapter 13, Paul talks about the role of government. And the Bible, amazingly as it seems, says the government, a just government that is, a government that's based on morals and righteousness, the government acting justly is actually a minister of God. Now, when we think of the word minister, we think of a preacher in a pulpit, don't we? But the government, when acting justly, is actually serving God. Now, we're going to have to come back to this next week, but let me just say this. What our position must be is to elect leaders. We are very fortunate to have a representative republic. We have a vote and a voice. And we can change our culture with ballots, not bullets. We don't, at least to this point, we don't have to have an insurrection or a revolution. We, every two years and every four years, we can cast votes. And it is on us to be informed and to elect leaders that are moral and just. Maybe even some of you, you have a calling from the Lord to run for office. And not only can we choose our leaders, if you feel so led, you can be a leader. So Katie, thank you for that question. And that's why we are, like the Bible says, to live humbly before God and to act justly and to implement and sustain a just government. Now here's Kevin from Cincinnati. What is Reformed theology? Boy, today we got th these questions that could be Pandora's box opened. We could go a long time. All right, this is sort of an intramural debate within Christendom. Christianity believes Jesus is the Son of God, rose from the dead, and we come to Christ through faith. Now, within that large classification, there are several different categories of how people parse out the details of the Bible. Uh, Reformed theology, uh, I'm going to give you the big place where I differ with Reformed theology. And I'll give you how this whole scheme, or much of this scheme, is based on one verse. In the New Testament book of Galatians, Galatians 6 verse 16, it references a phrase called the Israel of God. Here is how Reformed theology, to a degree, and there's so much I could say, but time doesn't permit a full fully orbed unpacking of this. Reformed theology says the church is Israel. I believe that Israel is Israel and the church is the church. Uh, I, I honestly do believe that one day uh, the nation of Israel will occupy all of the land God promised them all the way back in the book of Genesis. And so we're, we're going to come back to this, but Jude verse 3, in the New Testament, there's a book, uh, a verse in Jude. It says that we are to present, explain, defend the faith once delivered to the saints. And when I talk to somebody who's Reformed, and if you are a Reformed, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, replacement theology person, you're going to know what those code words mean. Hey, I love you. We're, we're brothers in Christ. But exactly what about the gospel needed to be reformed? Uh, I think Israel is Israel, the church is the church, and we really, if we look at the entire panorama of Scripture, we don't want to confuse the two because there are promises made to the church, promises made to Israel. Now, Jesus Christ claimed to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Isaiah 14, uh, 49 rather talks about this promised Messiah that would come the Redeemer of Israel, the light to the Gentiles. And I think that uh, there's a lot that we do know. There's some things that we can't know. There, there are a lot of scriptures that are very clear, some that are fairly ambiguous. But Reformed theology, I'm not saying they don't love the Lord and follow Christ. They do. But I, I think the biggest distinction is how they sometimes appropriate to the church the promises that were made to Israel. Now, back to doubters and skeptics, let me just say this, folks. It's okay if people have questions, but there is the responsibility to respond to truth when we find the answer to the questions. And for those of us that are believers, and we're reaching out and building relationships to those that maybe aren't, our posture should never be one of like me versus you, 
against each other. No. How about us together on a journey to find the truth? I honestly think it's like 80% relationship, 20% data. And I want to challenge you as you, if you are a skeptic, hey, I believe the evidence for the Bible is compelling. Spent three decades working on it, researching it, writing it. But if you are a believer, help the skeptics in your life see not only, listen, not only that we have a true message, but that we are authentic messengers. And so let's rise to the challenge of 1 Peter 3.15. And for a world that has questions or even objections, let's speak truth, but more importantly, even let's model truth. And as the Bible says, let's always be ready. God bless you. Please share us, post us, like us, because we like you, and we thank you for watching.